I was pastoring in Athens, Georgia, which is my hometown. Pastor Warner called me early in the year, 89, and asked me if I wanted to go preach in a crusade in Liberia. I never really even thought about Africa at all. I was just pastoring in Athens, enjoying my life. And so I said, sure. And he said, by the way, when you go, maybe stop in Sierra Leone and see what you think. I didn't know what he was talking about. So I preached in, in, in Liberia and uh, took a small little plane over to Sierra Leone. It was, it was a trip because I'm on this plane and there's a goat in the, in the aisle beside me. There's chickens on the plane. There are people standing up in the aisle. The plane is like, oh my God. So, so I get to Sierra Leone. As I get off the plane, as I step, as I step into Freetown, the Spirit of God speaks to me. Since you're home, just like that. I go around Sierra Leone with this thought in my head, I'm home. I look at the area, I already made up my mind, I'm gonna come. Came back, told Renee, we're going to Sierra Leone, you know. And as I pack your bag, God said it. God called me to Sierra Leone. You know, I got saved when I was 16 years old. I got involved in ministry. Every time the church doors were open, I was there and, and totally absorbed my life in the gospel. And I remember the night my brothers and I came home. It was about one o'clock in the morning. We were coming home from an outreach and my mother was home. She was upset and she started to tell us about how our cousins are excelling and one is graduating to be an architect. And at that time, we were not amounting to very much. What God was doing was on the inside. My parents were educators, but I said, I'm, I'm not gonna go to college. I'm going to make myself available for ministry and be discipled and work a job. I began to court Yolanda Cordova. She had the same heart for God. She was in college under scholarship. She made a, a choice to forego the career she wanted, which was to be a, a coach, because she knew that I wanted to preach the gospel and that she would become a pastor's wife. We just went all in. We're not telling people, you go here, you go there. We simply work with a man's burden and a man's calling. The eyes of the Lord run to and fro throughout the whole earth, seeking to show himself strong in the behalf of them whose hearts are perfect towards him. It's like God's searching, he's looking. If I can find someone who's wholehearted uh, and wants to do something for me, I'm gonna show myself strong in their behalf. It makes no difference how I feel. It makes no difference how much hell comes against me. It makes no difference what my emotions are going through right now. God, because I know who you are, I give you worship and I give you honor. Somebody give him praise. The first day I got to Tucson, the guy that the military base sent to pick me up at the airport was a guy who was a member of Pastor Warner's church. He said, my name is Sergeant Mark Rogers. I'm a born again Christian, how about you? I came to visit the church and they were on me. And you know, of course, I just wanted to live in sin and be a sinner, get away from home. I was 18 years old, let my hair down. And God already had a plan for me to get connected to that church. See, this is how powerful the church is because had I not gone to a church, then I wouldn't even be sitting here today. Church is destiny shaping. Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. This dealt, number one, with identity. We are the church, God's crown jewel, because this is who Jesus died for. Jesus said, I will build my church. That's mission, that is a call to labor that we all have. The third part of that was, the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, that he inserted in that mission the promise of overcoming a dimension beyond ourselves. There is a power that enables the church to overcome. And so identity, mission, and power. I come to you right now in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray for forgiveness. 
As I look at our workers, there is no question that one of the greatest blessings is doing something for God in another culture, the drawing together of a family unit, discipling your children. It brings a grace in the realm of communication. There's a trust that is built. Even with the difficulties, they'll tell you, no, this has been one of the greatest things, if not the greatest thing that I've ever done. Watching our parents go through things and them having crazy moments where they just believed God for anything. We wanted our children to experience that so that one day, whatever the God's call is for their life, they will have um, some ammunition, they will have some tools. We were in Long Beach for six years. We love Long Beach, we love the people there, and we really felt and believed we were gonna be there for some time. And we were at a conference, and Pastor Warner calls us to the office about an opportunity to come to Lakewood, Washington. And it wasn't like we jumped for joy in the office. Oh, let's just go to uh, the Northwest, and yeah, see you later, Long Beach. There was tears, there was talk, uh, all alone in the car, what are we gonna do? When Pastor Warner asked my family to take over the church, one of the things that Pastor Ruby did was he sat down and told me about the very real financial realities of living in Southern California, just to live, just to, just to survive out here. And that was very scary to me. I view myself as a simple man. I don't have a college education. I thought there's no way that I could make that amount of money by myself. We've got a child and one on the way. And there was a real step of faith for that. In November of 2010, I had uh, developed this, just a severe headache. And uh, from the headache, it uh, led to nausea. And then pretty soon I couldn't function. And even the doctors were a bit confused. We were treating symptoms and not really focusing on the issue. That lasted uh, over a year. My wife had been watching me and seeing me deteriorate right in front of her. My heart was failing. Both of my kidneys had failed. I found him on the floor. He wasn't responding very well. His breathing was not steady. I knew that I was losing him. There came a point where I had to talk to my kids and I wanted to, to make sure that, that this was the last moment I needed to leave them with something that they would be able to hold on to for the rest of their lives. With my older son, I did tell him, yeah, you need to take care of your mom no matter what happens. I'm sure he read between the lines. One of the things that really blessed me about Bianca is I asked her point blank, putting all these things together, what are we going to do? She says, what can we do? We've got to do the will of God. One of our biggest fears is to step outside of the will of God what if we didn't come up here? It almost scares me to say that me and my wife and my kids have gone you know, so much closer. Pastoring together as a family, it's so beautiful what God does. I see a lot of unity. We're in this together. Since I've been here, through the course of events, God's given me a wonderful job that I can support my family on. Uh, one of the biggest victories is that my boss just gave me a $20,000 a year pay raise, which put me at the number that Pastor Ruby told me I needed to make. News got out, you know, that I needed a kidney. Corey Galendez in the Tucson congregation. Well, long behold, he was a, a perfect match in, in tissue as well as blood type, and everything fell into place exactly. And, I felt like I hadn't felt in a long time. Just this last March, they gave me a clean bill of health. God really did move. I believe that this trial that we overcame with my illness has brought our family together, has brought me and my wife together. Our kids are watching all this. We want them to understand that, you know, they can do this too, that God is a God of, of the impossible. So thankful that I listen. And I said, yes, Lord. I've been able to see God move in people's life, not just in my family back home, to Long Beach all the way to the Northwest. My daughters have been able to experience these different cities, meet all these different people. My wife being able to see her grow and how her ministry just flourishes. Every Friday morning, she gets a bunch of food ready and invites all these ladies from our church. Just a time and hour for them to come, be in God's presence, be amongst sisters, encouraging each other to be open and to build those relationships. Some barriers have been broken. Prayers have been answered. 
As people come together and believe in something and fight for something, you know what? You see great fruit from that. And we've been able to see that in Lakewood. I know what I was and I know who I am now and I believe that God can do that in anybody. And if one person gets it, one person gets saved and just flourishes, it's all worth it. I want the very best for my son and my daughter and my daughter that's on the way. I want the very best for them. And sometimes I feel that the very best that people can become is when they're challenged. They get to see me uh, stretched. They get to see me pushed. They get to see me in my best and my worst moments. Even though they're young, it will in time fall onto them that they can take a risk a spiritual risk in whatever avenue they want to do, that they can do that and know that it's okay. The greatest satisfaction is seeing the growth and the development in the men and women that we have sent out or that are involved in the work of the church here. We fantasize and we like to think, well, you know, it would be nice if we had have kept on to all of them and oh we'd have a bigger church well you're making the assumption that if you'd have tried to hold on real tight that they'd be the same kind of individual that they are today not true i believe it's in the process of releasing them to the will of god that they have themselves found the growth the development and the anointing that is upon their lives living a life in the ministry for basically our entire adult lives, raising our children in the ministry, there were a lot of sacrifices. A wife that has to kind of give up her husband and children and have to give up their parents. But when you live your life oriented around serving others, there's always a great reward. You can survive for a little while without leadership, but listen to me, one day, who's in charge is going to matter. We make the observation very often that people who served in the military made good Christians. When these uh, guys go to boot camp and they drill them and they jam them, and they confront their rebellion, uh, listen to authority, they're not speaking in some abstract fashion, you know, about being a good soldier and so you can win an award on a parade ground. Some of those guys had been a D-Day. And they knew that when your sergeant says you got to get out of the boat and expose yourself to live fire, that the only reason you did it is because you'd been taught to obey authority. Bullets flying over their head, people getting shot all around them, and here comes the sergeant ordering them to get up and to charge, and, and everything in them says, I don't want to do it, but they've been taught you better obey authority because it's shaking time now, and if you don't know who you're going to listen to, you're going to get blown up. Being raised in a broken home, I didn't have a father uh, figure there or anybody to show me how to be a husband. And so one of the things that really helped me was watching my pastor, Richard Ruby, just seeing how he interacted with his children, uh, his wife. Just remember him telling us that was something that we could all contend for. So I just basically applied what I saw him doing. My dad was a little more abusive and I didn't have a good relationship with him at all. And Pastor Ruby really, really stepped in in that arena. I remember another time when we were working on the building. We were there and we are laboring and we had been there 13, 14 hours and we were tired. As I'm laying on the floor, I'm looking up and he doesn't even know I'm watching him. He's sweating, he's tired and he's praying and he's praying for, for people. And it was in that time that I, I realized that this, this man was really concerned and cared about people. And I was from that day, I just said, you know what? I'm gonna focus my life on serving the man of God. And God told me, he says, if you just are faithful and you serve your pastor, one day I'll give you men. And I'm seeing God fulfill the thing that he said he was gonna do in our lives. I got saved in 1990, and I believe there's probably three churches that Pastor Ruby had out at the time. From that time till now, I wanna say there's probably over 100 churches that are under his ministry. There are churches in Africa, churches in Central America, South America, also Vietnam, China. And so we're seeing an increase of couples that want to go into the mission field. Here, I'm reaching a lot of the same people with the same background 
uh, broken homes, addictions, involvement in gangs. As they're coming in and they're seeing that their pastor is a man that was able to come out of that scene and have a good marriage and ministry, they're immediately drawn. From the age of 24 to the age of 34, I was one of those drug addicts that just woke up thinking, where am I gonna get my next hit? By the age of 33 years old, you know, I had already two daughters. And at six o'clock in the morning on my daughter's fourth birthday, I robbed the store for one more hit. You know, I got arrested and I made that infamous call. He was on his way to prison for the rest of his life. And here's how that call went. He said, babe, <laughs> that's a drug addict for you. Still calling her babe. Watch it when they call you babe. I really messed up this time. I'm not coming home. And the next thing David heard was this little voice that said, Daddy, Daddy, today was my birthday and you weren't here. Are you coming now? David wanted to die, but listen to me, folks. That day, his whole world came crumbling down on him and there was nothing he could do. He was hopeless. Have you ever been hopeless? Has your world ever come crumbling down on you? Orlando Salinas is a very powerful testimony in our church. He was announced as an evangelist out of Tucson. Has a ministry called Choose to Change, where he's able to go in and speak to parolees as they're on their way out. They make a choice whether they want to go to AA or to Choose to Change, which is a program that he has here in the church where he challenges those men. Because he's been to prison for 13 years, he's really able to relate to these men because of that ministry. Uh, today, we probably have about 25 to 30 of those men. Uh, some of them are already preaching. I started coming to Choose to Change. I met Orlando at the parole office when I got out. Started serving in the church and Choose to Change. Seven months ago, God restored my family. So I go into the class and the first thing Orlando says, I'm looking for men and I want to challenge them. He spoke truth and that's what I needed. I understood that if he could do it, I could do it. It was a battle between my wife, you know, because she was a full-blown Catholic. But little by little, God started moving. She started coming to service more and more. I am called to preach. One day I will be out there. My daughter Andrea, she was the one that was four years old when I robbed the store. When she got married, she gave me a letter how she had forgiven me for everything that I'd done. And my daughter, Andrea, married a pioneer pastor. And it's a miracle that God has done in our lives. My whole family is involved at the Door Christian Fellowship in McAllen, Texas. This is my third church that I've taken over. I was a missionary in, in Bolivia. No matter where you're at, if you simply just love people, invest in them, make them believe that they are full of potential and they can accomplish anything that they want with Christ. And you take the time to interact with them as we go and play volleyball with them, as we go and do the things that they like to do in fellowship, that it's just really linking our hearts together. And they're going and telling other people, hey, you need to come to this church. It's very, very welcoming. And we're finding that just simply loving people is one of the main keys to growth. You're not going to be able to sing it like statues. You understand what I mean? You can't sing the song and just stand there. There's got to be some praise in the song. You know what I'm saying? I know y'all ain't used to praising God. I know, the, I know, I know it's hard. It's going to be hard. But you have to fake it till you make it. You know what I'm saying? The sound of heavy touching earth, our Father. All of heaven rolls your name. Sing. Probably outside of just giving your life to Jesus. Uh, probably the second most important thing as far as your spiritual life is being a part of the fellowship of your church because we are social creatures and no one likes to stand alone. You go out in the world, everybody's living in sin and doing one thing and you feel so odd and so you're tempted to go in with them not so much because you agree but because we're social creatures. When you find that sense of fellowship, the smiles, the joy, the jubilation, the laughter, when you find that in the church, you don't have to go and find that anywhere else. Been in Athens, Georgia since June of 1989. Took over the church from Pastor Alvin Smith when he felt the call to Sierra Leone, West Africa. We were pastoring in Columbia, South Carolina at the time. We came from Columbia to here and have been here ever since. 27 years this June. 
First thing that struck me about it was just the diversity. I mean, there were so many different people all gathered together, and you know, I'd never seen that before. The town I grew up in, uh, we didn't have that at all. Past the Valley was white, you had blacks and Hispanics. Uh, I grew up going to an all-black church. And so when I walked in and I saw all of these different people all worshiping God together, that really did impact me. Uh, the second thing that impacted me was when the service ended, no one left. I remember thinking to myself, wow, these people really love each other. We actually met in the church. We've been married almost 19 years now. We went through a season in our marriage to where it was like, what's going on and I can remember Pastor Lavalley you know giving us counseling and that made all the difference to where you know we're still married today. Anytime we have an issue we can go to them and their example of a marriage is the foundation of this church. We're seeing the raising up of individual Bible study leaders and couples and emphasizing their role in the entire fabric of the church. They are learning how to shepherd people, help people, because the only way the church is going to grow is they themselves become fruitful. There are people that look at you and they reference from you. I saw my pastor, he had a promising career in the military. And one thing that really captured me about his testimony is that he cashed that in. You know, he uh, put that to the side and served God. That kind of struck me that, you know what, it's, it's more than life than just making money, than about careers and all those things. It's something worth living for. And I think being out here pioneering, there's no greater uh, challenge or thrill or just satisfaction than seeing people saved. This is the greatest calling uh, to serve God and to see other people come to Christ. Fellowshipping inspires you. Fellowship strengthens you because you're around like-minded people. One man's battle is strengthening another man's. Another man's victory is giving another man hope. People go through the same battles, they share their stories, and you leave that gathering strengthened. Now think about that in a broader term. Think about 500 churches. Think about 1,500 churches or 2,000 churches like our fellowship of churches. Think about a Bible conference where you have a whole group of churches and pastors coming together, singing the same songs, praying the prayers for vision and for discipleship. Can you see the power of that? At 19 years old, I decided to join the military. Got deployed in 2004, spent a year in the Middle East. There was a lot of churches and there was a lot of people that were fasting, contending for my life that I don't even know. I remember specifically there was one instance where uh, I hadn't really smiled since I'd been in the Middle East. And I remember one day we were on a bridge and I'm in the middle of a war zone and um, I'm looking for bombs and terrorists and cars. I remember I had a sense of joy come over me and I, I took a moment and I had a smile and I smiled really big. Later on I was talking to somebody and they mentioned that they felt the need to pray for me. It was very much at the same moment that I, I had that smile. The door in Long Beach has given me hope. They see me for me, you know? Not for what they see on the outside. Lucy, there's this girl that goes to this church, and I seen that she was very different than anyone else, you know? She wasn't at the parties, she wasn't at the, the places that we were at. She saw me, you know, who I was, and uh, I was fighting this homosexuality, and you know, and she still loved me, you know? She still, did, she never judged me. I didn't feel, I felt love, and I was like, you don't even know me. After that, I just started asking her questions, like, oh, so how does God feel about this? How does God feel about that? And she's like, just come to church with us, just come. I'm like, but doesn't he hate me? She's like, God loves you. What the world really wants to do and what our flesh is kind of longing for is a way to nullify the house of God. And so we're trying to come up with ways to negate our need for God. But that's so hard because we genuinely need Him and we genuinely need that relationship and there really is nothing that's going to take His place in our lives. There's no substitute for life in the family of God. I know the theme of the conference this year is the prevailing church. I think about that in terms of the context of our work in Africa, this particular trip to Tanzania. I think about two churches. Number one, I think about the White House Church in Santa Monica. They're totally supportive of what we're doing. No question in my mind that if we didn't have our congregation, we would not be able to do what we do. 
Number two, we're hooking up with a foreign church. We're hooking up with Desi Wheeler, that richness of fellowship that we enjoy with Desi and his wife, Renee. There's nothing like doing a project when one church joins hands with another church. It's a powerful thing. This is for Teresa. Teresa, okay. One in the morning, one at night. Okay. All right. Hii mama ni kwa ajili ya maumivu. Sawa. Na unaitumia tu unaposikia maumivu. This year, I invited some of our pastors from around the area to come and help translate. And the expectation I was looking for was to forge that relationship between our African pastors and their wives and their disciples. And it was absolutely a blessing because now our church has put faces to our fellowship. My name is uh, Pastor Juma Numbi. I come from uh, Burundi to where I'm pastoring with my wife, Flavia Numbi. Dans cette situation où nous traversons, la situation d'insécurité, la situation de la guerre, la situation politique qui paralyse tout le secteur, qu'il y a d'autres églises qui font partenaire avec les mouvements politiques, qui commencent même à appuyer certaines idées politiques. Mais pour nous, nous prêchons Jésus et tout le monde voit que nous sommes différents d'autres églises. Et certaines familles viennent témoigner que nous allons être avec vous parce que vous êtes quelqu'un qui n'est pas partial et qui prêche la vérité. We were able to bring three people from the church in Dar es Salaam to the medical team in Wanzer. The mindset of people in Tanzania as a whole, the church is business. The church comes to rob people. But the medical team coming to Windsor and treating people free, giving free medical, changed the mindset of Tanzanians that we are not a fellowship that come to rob people but to give. So the people that have brought it has changed their mindset. They are going back home refreshed, revived, and they are going to tell the people of the church in Dar es Salaam that we have a great fellowship. It's not just Dar es Salaam. We have a church that impact the nation. In Jesus' name, O oh Lord, Father God, we just pray, my Lord God, for complete healing, O oh Lord God, as this lady for her symptoms. In Jesus' name, Lord Father God. A lot of the people who walk in our door are Muslims. They're not Christians. They're told, and they're not supposed to like us. But we greet them, we love them, we take care of them, we give them free medications, we give them soccer balls, we give them little dollies, we give them lollipops. And uh, they walk away and they have to, at some level in their heart, they have to look back and say, wow, that was different. They're, the Christians are good people. We're making a statement toward, for Desi and, and the love that he has for those people and for Christ. My message to the Tucson Church is beyond words for all the generosity that they show to construct this building, which is gonna be a blessing to the municipality of Sapandalaga. It's the closest building to the central market area. It's very convenient for the citizens within the town to get to, and God has just provided a perfect venue for the saints to assemble, to worship God, and to hear His precious word. We've had concerns with not having electrical power, no water, we were forced to dig a well. There's a concerns with dealing with the Filipino workers, a communication problem, a cultural problem. All these issues, the bottom line is, it took 20 months to build this church and it was dedicated by evangelist Larry Beauregard on May 27th. We had our first revival service that Friday night. We had 65 people within the church and 12 responded to the altar call. Jesus said, I will build my church. This is why after 2,000 years, you can look at all kinds of opposition towards the Bible, towards the church, towards all manner of things. The church is still alive and well because it's not our creation. The gospel has the ability to prevail. That's where our hope is. Christianity is a crutch and so much more. And that's good news because we're all crippled. And it's the only crutch that can truly bear the weight of our brokenness. The next time I hear Christianity is a crutch, you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna agree. 
I'm not going to sit there and argue, you know, and you know, try to feel a little, no, I'm going to say, I agree. I'm the guy whose legs are broken. When someone said Christianity is for the feeble-minded, I'm going to agree because you know what? My mind was all jacked up when Christ found me and it was the gospel that brought to me a right mind. When I hear Christianity is something for weak people, I'm going to agree because you know what? I'm weak uh, and so are you. Uh, you just don't know it or you won't acknowledge it. Life is tough, but God is good. Those two things never change. If there's one thing I want to do in my preaching and my ministry, it's to acquaint people with reality, to be able to live in the good times and in the bad times for Jesus. And so there's a promise uh, that is just as real as all the other promises. John 16, where Jesus said, in the world you shall have tribulation. And the word means pressure. When we went to Houston, the first month we were there, a young man came in and, and we got saved. We'd only known them maybe four weeks. But what God had done in their life was so powerful. So they came along to the Tucson conference with us. That Wednesday night, I testified. Church had only been open three months. And I said we were able to bring one couple with us. Everybody cheered. Well, that night, Oscar was sitting, he and his wife, on the east side of the church, right by the double doors. And uh, at the beginning of the sermon, there was a loud noise. Then I heard a, a scream, and I recognized a voice. It was. A, Oscar's wife Yolanda and so I looked up and she was standing and so I ran over there and uh, Oscar had been shot in the head and I remember trying to talk to him <laughs> uh, but it was pretty clear there was a random drive-by. A lot of people in the room didn't know where the shot came from. They didn't know whether there was a shooter loose in the building. You can imagine what it, kind of mayhem would ensue in a public service. And so before we knew it, first responders were here, police, the news. It was really an astonishingly tragic moment. And you would think that something like that could just not only put a pal over the conference of that particular week, but that it could actually undermine the confidence that people had in our ministry, that just to even come to church and not be under some kind of threat. We were evacuated twice because of the war and how it was affecting the nation. We live very close to the military barracks. I'll never forget looking out the window and seeing soldiers climb up trees holding guns because they thought they were gonna come and overrun the barracks. I was right by the barracks. We sat down on the floor in the hallway. The Georgia was a small baby, and we sat there, and they were shooting. A projectile came down through our, our roof in our house, and it was the most thunderous, fearful thing you ever heard. We went to the hospital. Oscar hung on for about 24 hours, and that allowed his family to come. Some of his family was in church and they were very supportive, they were very understanding, but not all of them. I remember one of his sisters saying to me, who are you? We don't even know you. What have you done to our brother? At that time, we are 24. You had asked him, and I, we thought we were experienced. We'd pastored for three years, three and a half years already, but you know, we were kids and uh, that was a very, very difficult time because you realize that what we're involved in really is life and death. Brad Breckenridge, one of the brothers here who's been a contractor for many years, was in here following the service, tearing out carpet, fixing the door. Uh, the next morning we had prayer meeting as usual. I remember Pastor Warner, Thursday night, planting his chair right over there in that front aisle on the northeast side of this auditorium. And in fact, he still sits there to this day, probably based on the events of that night, where he was demonstrating that we're going on, we're going forward, we serve a God 
who is not intimidated. He's not turned aside. He's not fearful. And his actions during that time gave us confidence that God was in full control, not mad, but God was in full control, and that whatever the devil uh, was trying to do was never going to be enough. Pastor Warner's leadership and guidance during that time, very, very important, very powerful for me. I remember that Friday night, he planted a bunch of churches, and I realized, you know, we're not going to stop and we're not going to go backwards. We're going to go forwards. 1987, in the next 10 years, it's some of the most fruitful years this church has ever seen in terms of its growth and its church planting. We started the church in an old, by our standards, condemned building. The windows were all broken, preached with a kerosene lantern. I remember preaching and telling these young men, one day you're gonna preach in all the world, other nations, poor. These guys are poor. They would fight over the candles just to take them home and read the Bible at night. One thing that will never leave me is that God truly raised up disciples in a situation that was so bad, a country that was broken down and people had forgotten. During that whole time, Edward was up in Kenema. I sent him out. I was preparing him to come and take the work in the event that I had to leave, and that happened. And so he took the church. God has kept his church, and his church prevails. Everyone is called to be a minister. That's what discipleship is, and that should be the prayer of every Christian. Lord, I want you to use my life in whatever capacity you desire. You really tap into real living when that becomes your burden. Because we did our due diligence in the area of discipleship. These guys went in the areas that we had never had churches. We had Peter Dorr, one of our first missionaries. He went to the Gambia, Burundi, Ethiopia. Him and his wife, Jennifer, just did an incredible job. Pastor Erebu in Liberia, and his wife, Mariama. Three churches in Liberia now. Been through the Ebola crisis, war. Ebola just devastated that country and I'm in the church, and we're singing and worshiping God, and you would never know that Ebola ever visited that nation. There was a, a pandemonium, a joy, a rejoicing, a presence of God. Pastor Maury in Tanzania and his wife Hannah doing a great job there. People have invested over the years. They pray, they fasted, they've gone on medical teams, and today we are seeing God move in an unprecedented way. Just in Sierra Leone, at the conference, 12 churches sent out, five sent out of a baby church in Kinema. All the churches are self-supporting. It gives me hope for all the other nations that we have churches in that we're still supporting. One day those churches will be completely indigenous as well. That's our vision and that's what we're moving towards. That's a prevailing church.